Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Chingo Chats. Uh, it's your boy Chingo Bling. We got producer Rob in the building. What's up, man? So uh, I want to let our guests introduce themselves, um, although I know they're going to leave some stuff out. And, and should I do my intro first? Should I, should I talk about them before they talk about themselves? Should we, should we let the guests be first front runners? Okay, we'll let the guests go first, man. But I have a lot to say about these cats. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have Mike Frost and Toe Down. Everybody, nice to meet y'all. Yeah. my partner mike frost mike you want to kick it off uh I mean, yeah i mean i, I don't shit sure, i guess so i don't talk about myself too much but he, uh, he was hoping i would do it <laughs> I, I was going for that but so uh, yeah my name is mike frost i'm from houston texas album cover designer um pretty much if you uh think of houston in the last 20 years you probably probably think about you know, some stuff that I've done for uh, Slim Thug, Chameleon Air, Paul Wall, Switch House, Rap a Lot, Zero, Trey, Devin. Um, to everybody. I don't think Chingo himself. Uh, I don't think there's anybody in the city I, I haven't worked for. So, uh, or done some album covers for. Some of a lot of that stuff on right behind uh, Toe Down's Wall. We worked on a lot of the same projects together um, without even knowing it really. The uh, but yeah, that's it. That's, that's yeah, I, that's I, my claim I, to fame. I'll chime in as well. Um, Toe Down, let them know, man. Let them know your background. So, uh, my name is Toe Down. Um, I'm a former recording artist, a uh, former producer, former engineer, former drug trafficking organizer, and leader of the Terrio Drug Trafficking Organization. Yeah, I said it loud and proud. So, not only, like Mike said, have we produced a whole bunch of records. If you heard music come out of Houston between 2000 and 2011, either we recorded it, mixed it, mastered it, produced it, engineered, whatever you can think of, we were the spot. We had a first all digital studio here in Houston, and we had probably some of the best chronic in town as well. Uh, 2008, I got incarcerated uh, for the first time. 2011, I started my Fed bid. 2017, came home and here I lay. Hell yeah, man. Welcome home, brother. Um, so let me add on to that. Um, <laughs> you, you guys did a great job of kind of like summarizing. Um, man, if we could just reminisce real quick, like the golden era, the Take end, back. dude, the end of an era Take in, me there. in the golden era of Houston hip hop, when there were, there was a thing called record stores and you had like, <laughs> you had Southwest wholesale distribution Whoa. Um, um, I mean, just, I guess, let's just start with Mike. Like Mike said, very humbly, you know, if you notice some of the imagery and some of the branding, some of the photography, it had my thumbprint, had my touch on it. Cause you know, obviously you had pen and pixel, they would do stuff for no limit and cash money and, you know, dope house, things like that. But then a, a young hungry fella named Mike Frost, he might've had a one, me he might've had a one megapixel camera at the time. <laughs> He might have had the first edition of Photoshop ever came out. Yeah. Uh, a co-invented illustrator, but this gentleman basically came at it the way a lot of the rap artists did, which was like from out the mud, just like I'm going to use the, my creativity, my imagination, I'm express myself and just network. Next thing you know, it's like, man, like he said, come in there and oh, dope house, switch your house. Like it was really no more pen and pixel after that. Um, and everything you saw on the shelves, in the streets, out the trunks, you know, all the vinyls to the, to the, it was like the visual to the soundtrack at the time. And now obviously Houston, now people think of Houston, they think like, oh, Travis Scott and his imagery and stuff like that. But Travis Scott probably grew up <laughs> studying what, what uh, Mike was doing for Zero and Trey and, and everybody else. And then Toe Down, I didn't know, like now it makes sense. Cause I was like, bro, this dude's albums were so well put together, so well produced. Like the features, he didn't let none of the features outshine him on there. He was holding his own. He'd go first a lot of times. I mean, the feature list alone, it was like a who's who of who was hot in, in, the, in that era. Everybody from, you know, Slim Thug. Uh, let me look, click on this one, man. Shit. You had 8-Ball, Lil Flip, Hawk. Uh, R.I.P. Big Hawk, Slim Thug, Willie D. The Ghetto Boys, C-Note, Botany Boys, Lil Kiki, Ronnie Spencer, Papa Rue, Bum B. I mean, a lot more others on the other albums. And I would argue, bro, that you were ahead of your time on the uh, 
the dirty south, no, 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 pulling up. Well, you know, Hawk said it best. He said, toe down is a trendsetter. And, you know, I just try to live up to those words every day. Hawk and I were extremely close. You know, we were going to be the, uh, along with DJ Screw, we were going to be the Dr. Dre and Eminem of the South, and Hawk was coming along with us. And so, you know, big shout out to Misha and the boys. So uh, they're still kicking and going on. And, you know, we love that family, love Hawk, you know. But uh, yeah, Dirty South. I mean, can you think? Uh, that was 99, 2000. So 22 years ahead of its time. And yeah. just like Pimp C, there's a whole genre now of country rap. And that might be the uh, rhythm and blues, soulful country rap he was talking about. But there is actually a lane of country yeah. rap artists, Bubba Sparks and Jelly Roll and Haystack. And here these guys are out the mud and you have, you know, Colt Ford and it's now a whole industry with mud parks and all this other crazy, you know, things going on. So, you know, we were way light years ahead of time back then. You well, know, uh, and it was just arguably, I mean, arguably, I think it was produced by Grizz, right? Yeah, Grizz, man, you did your homework. Yeah, so Grizz and I got together in the studio and uh, had this funky blues riff that came through. And I pinned the hook in like five minutes. My brother sent me to the studio that day to go get a dance track because we needed some dance music for the club. Because I think Three Six Mafia just came out with like, tear the club up, bitch, tear the club up, mm -hmm. tear the club yeah. up. So they're like, go get me one of those. And I came back with the dirty style, we want to smile, pouring up smoking now keeping it hot like the middle of june i'm just a texas tycoon making country rap tunes yeah so that came out and next thing you know you know a couple of djs from the box heard it next thing you know it's kind of like the draft but you can pick the team you know they don't want uh you know uh somebody that's not hot and on fire and at that time i think every radio station in the south was just burning it up you know when it's your song on the radio, they can never play it enough. But when you're sitting on the reverse side, you're like, man, are they ever going to stop playing that trash? You know, it's like that. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. When it's, you know, when it's your song, it's always, man, play that shit again. <laughs> Dude, you know, what's, you know what's funny is um, you had mentioned to me uh, that Charles Chavez was involved with uh, the promotion of a single. And I had a meeting with Charles Chavez. I just had a demo this is a long, long time ago. And uh, he was like, yeah, man, let's just sign this paper and let's get you distributed and get you the pen and pixel graphics posters and all that. And, and, and he started to tell me about what he does. I was, and he mentioned some people that were clients of his of a uh, record promotion. I was like, Oh yeah. Also toe down. And I mentioned like one or two others. He's like, how'd you know I work with toe down? I was like, dude, I, I met, I met toe down. I interviewed him on my, uh, on my show on college radio. And from then on the meeting went towards like a, uh, like he knows too much <laughs> <laughs> just kind of like okay i'm not gonna just i'm not gonna give him the first free contract like he like it's like i had already kind of just networked and understood a thing or two about the distribution also i want to say that on the song you did with little flip we shining dude right. if flip dropped that today that's right i mean he could probably have a resurgence Listen, it was like, holy crap, that's, oh my God. You could actually just take that song and put it out today. I mean, whenever I try to write music, I don't try to put dates in there. You know, I generalize a lot of things so it can, you know, stand the test of time because I believe that a song could actually outlive you and keep going. And so I, I don't ever put like exact dates in there. Um, but, you know, I kind of generalize things. So, you know, maybe, who knows, maybe people will go download We Shining and it'll come back up or come back alive. I'll be back on stage doing my thing. Yeah, dude, it's super jamming. It's super jamming. Thanks, uh, sir. You know, like I said, the, the albums were well put together, the production to where, like, you know, you had... Listen, you keep giving me these compliments about music. You know how I mean to go back into the studio tonight and start a record, man. I, I'm, I'm too focused on other things, but you keep talking the way you're talking, man. I'm going to get back down there and do some grind and let these boys know. I mean, no, like, I, I'm, I feel the same way. I feel like with my music stuff, I was like, you know what? Stand-up comedy is treating me well. I enjoy podcasting. Like, I can't complain. I'm a family man. I have more balance in my life. I'm not the same little young punk running around. Uh -huh. But... You know, but you hear these tracks and it's like, yo, what is Grizz up to? And I didn't know Toe Down, you know, was, you know, was, you know, you know, your input on all this. You weren't just the artist. 
you know, you and your brother well, you know, label. At the time, what had happened um, when we we had a decision to make because my brother had the foresight to say in our contract with Electra that every nine months, regardless, they had to give us our advance plus twenty percent. And my first advance was for a half a million dollars and a half a million dollar video budget. So they had to give us another million plus two hundred thousand on top of it before the country rap tune video got finished being done editing and everything. So I remember flying back to Houston. There's a tour bus parked in front of my house. There's no CDs pressed up. There's no posters pressed up. There's no shirts pressed up. And I turned to my brother and I'm like, what do you want to do now? And, you know, he said, we're going to go get a, a house and we're going to get some recording equipment and you're going to start cranking out records. And when I started working on my record, I brought in all these other features. But what ended up happening was these features like Mike Jones, and Paul Wall and Chameleon Air and Bun B and they all want to record there. So it put all my stuff on the back burner. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know, we did Mike Jones' first album and Paul's first album. And we did the recording of Bone over at uh, for Chameleon Air Spot. And little Wayne's recording while he's going to U of H. And, you know, so that's how we kind of started getting all those uh, Swisher house deals and one thing led to another. And when you get one platinum plaque, people all want to go get a second platinum plaque and they think they can get one. And I remember one day I was chilling with baby bash one day. We kicking at the studio, smoking out of this volcano. He would ride around with a bag, yeah. a volcano. <laughs> the turkey he would bag. ride around with his bag, a turkey <laughs> bag. And he would ride around with the bag. And Everybody one day he comes that. in. The next, day, the next day I'm hearing, he moves about it like a cyclone. I'm like, what the fuck? Where'd that shit come from? Like, oh my God. So you never knew who was going to create a hit around us, you know? And it was just that type of atmosphere, you know? We weren't really thinking about making hits. Hits were just being formed and developed out of there. And we just had a good run, you know? So shout out to Bernard, my babysitter, my brother, my manager, my... Uh, caregiver. I mean, shit, he does it all, man. He does it all. Uh, uh, here's my impression of Bash. Nephew, I did the song called Sugar Sugar with Frank. <laughs> Mike Frost doing the pictures. It's going to be on my album. Mike Frost did the photo. <laughs> <laughs> all out that bag. It was like uh, no smoke. It was just a vaporized yeah. volcano weed. But, uh, but, but listen, I, I will say this, you know, Every time we tried to be on that cutting edge of marketing all the time, whether it was a pill bottle flyer or a pill bottle one sheet or doing the chicken fried steak and sending out the one sheets and t-shirts and the chicken fried steak box, we always try to be creative. But there's this one motherfucker that would always come up with something better, something creative, whether he was selling tamales or hot sauce or whatever the fuck it was. We were always chasing behind Chingo's marketing and he was kicking ass and taking names and we're like what the, how did this guy come up with this shit he came up to no lies first time i'm like man i'm going to meet chingo i'm going to meet chingo he popped down his glasses and he said hey what's up i'm like dude i know who you are yeah it was the, the craziest shit ever and so we we're always chasing behind chingo on what he was going to do next and hey man what kind of crazy shit have you heard that song they did lately man that shit had me on the floor rolling and so we were always chasing behind chingo marketing wise so it, shout it out must, to you man it, thank you sir it must be something in the soil but but definitely um yeah you, you still got the taco truck i mean the tamale truck no mm -mm. no that that's a long story that got stolen illegally uh <laughs> thank you insurance <laughs> yeah. yeah but no definitely man like um like the prescription artwork, you know, the menu type of uh, theme, all that type of shit. And uh, speaking of uh, speaking of bash and, and all this stuff, um, I remember doing uh, a photo shoot with Mike Frost. You know, it was for the Baby Bash DVD where he had me featured. I was just along for the ride. I was the plus one. And I remember we went on this <laughs> rooftop because Mike always had an office somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Where he was just like digital trap house. <laughs> and I used to be like, damn, fool. How many megapixels is that camera? Oh, this right here. You know, this is four. You know, this is a little four. <laughs> I got the five on like, <laughs> Yeah, back then. Back then, right? But dude, that you shit would take one picture and you'd have to wait like 30 seconds to take another picture to write the memory card. You but could dude, take sticks real fast. Yeah, man. Like, man, like talk to us about your creative approach. Like when you approach um, you know, a client and 
you have to like, especially back then, it'd be like, all right, we're in Camillionaire's garage. I got to put this light right here. I'm guess I'm going for this type of lighting and I'm going to have to go in digitally and post and revamp, revamp the whole fucking thing. Like, how do you, how did you come up with that shit? You know, a little bit of it came like I went, Orbit, Orbit told me about Pan Pixel. Like one thing about, about, about a toe down is first time I ever heard of him was from a Ray Flyer. So like some of my, creative stuff comes from like punk rock and electronic music you can see behind me like comic books but i actually went to orbit told me about pen pixel and i actually went to try to get a job there and got turned down so i just wanted to be in the music business i was doing stuff for djs i was doing stuff for like rock dudes i, I just saw rap as like another group of musicians to do stuff for so i mean i, I had what we had like we didn't have like then like we were using disposable cameras and stuff like that i knew the hip-hop stuff i like coming from like you know nwa like beastie boys i knew beastie boys shot like their own stuff and they had this raw style so i kind of like pulled from shit i liked as a kid and i was just i went with what i could do but i didn't my my first thing was just make it raw and make it quality like go out to the hood go out to wherever like it and instead of trying to come up with concepts you know i guess it comes from comic books and other stuff i was like man i'm just gonna let like the artist be the concept like i'm gonna focus on building this character this identity so like every time i would do a a shoot one thing is it let me stand out completely from everybody else being raw about it and focus on quality allowed me to do it. I would just do as much work as I could for free if I had to. Like I, my thing was like, I'm gonna get my name everywhere I can. So it was, it was a mixture of those things. It was a mixture, a mixture of economics. Like the, we didn't have money for a bunch of stuff. Like my computer fell off the truck. Mm. Um, <laughs> gotcha. So allegedly. You know, so it was, you know, part of it was was really going after quality i was like really obsessed with that i decided like one thing anybody wasn't doing because you know a bunch of my homeboys would always make fun of like the rap stuff because it just it was to the point where it was just getting repeated so many times like that it was just it was so fake and like you're coming from like punk rock and they don't even want they don't even like money they don't like anything like it's raw it's real you know so and coming from the, the electronic music, everything's like futuristic and clean. So I just brought that over to, 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 to rap. And I was like, okay, well, and me being so new to the whole rap community, all that shit was live to me because I was like, this is dope. I've never seen any of this before. So me shooting like a regular picture, just kind of making it a little more dramatic with the lights. That was a whole new experience to me. So what people were seeing when they were looking at my, my artwork was someone looking at a whole culture with really the virgin eyes going in that stuff and being able to capture it and bring that out. So I already looked at them like they were, you know, stars or like action heroes and stuff like that. Like that everybody's lifestyle was just so different. So I think when a lot of people, you get bored of like your environment or something, but you go to another country and like their everyday life looks really interesting. So yeah. it was almost that effect yeah. for me. So I focused on bringing that out. And then I never focused on marketing to the rap crowd per se. I was always focused on marketing to a much broader audience. Yeah. Well, See, you Mike has this great ability. And the one thing that God gave him a gift for is he allows other people to shine. And he captures that moment in a timeless medium through film. And it's one of the great gifts that I've seen him do time after time with artists. You know, he'll be doing an album cover or be doing an artwork for somebody. And the way he gets that artist to stand out above everybody else, you can go down. I, well, not today, but in the old days when you had a CD store, you could go down and you could tell which one was Pen and Pixel which one was Mike Frost? You knew, you knew instantly who had did that uh, graphic work. And, and so that's one of the, you know, great gifts that Mike has. He allows other people to shine and gets them to shine, no matter if he's shooting on a disposable camera 
or if he's got a hundred megapixel cam uh, camera. I've seen him do it all. Yeah, yeah. one thing I used to do is I used to take the CD cover I did, I'd print it out and take it to the register store and stick it on the shelf in like the wrap section. Like that's why <laughs> Baby Bash is uh, one of his covers looked that way. It was totally different because I just did that and I was like, okay, this stands out from everything that's on the shelf. So if everybody would copy me or like be going with a certain style, I'd intentionally go a different direction, just visually. So it, it you just your eye spots and it, it sticks out from everything else. I think at one particular time, I think skulls, uh, tigers, and like mansions uh, were just the end thing. Like how many skulls could you put on an album cover? Like yeah. flames and skulls. I've seen so much flames and skull back then. I was going crazy. And then the over, you know, dramatic stuff that Finn and Pixel was doing. Mike just had this clean look to it, you know? <laughs> Sorry about that. Good. Even like doing design though, like just, I got bored of my own shit. So I just stopped for a while and now I've come back and I've totally changed everything, how I do everything. I don't do anything the same anymore. But one thing that's different now is n now when I do an art project, I don't look at it as about as being about the artist or being about me. Like I'm always trying to tap into a culture. I'm trying to put things out that people are going to like, that's going to resonate with people. Yeah. Like yeah, it was it was definitely influential because you would see you would see not only which is a Mike Frost cover, but which covers were inspired by Mike Frost uh -huh. <laughs> and like everything from the type fonts, the composition, you know, I mean, if you look over his uh, his left shoulder, you have zero a zero poster. It's like cut out, you know, so all the zero heads out there, they're probably obsessed with Mike Frost because mm. he, <laughs> he did all the art. He did all the art for all their favorite music. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Um, and how many times did you just sit there and stare at that artwork? You know, it's yeah. just one of those favorite things that NFTs are starting to allow people to do again. You know, we used to buy these things called records. And I would sit there and I would, you know, unfold the Michael Jackson record. How many times did you do that? Or stare at the Prince record for endless amounts of hours. You know, that was one of the great things that, you know, Mike could do. He could, he could get you in that trance on that album, fixated on that album for so long. That's what you want to do, you know. That's a perfect segue, actually. Can you guys, who can describe best for the audience that's not familiar with a non-fungible token? So it's super simple, right? A non-fungible token is a contract on the blockchain that can represent an event, a person, a picture, artwork, music, uh, the deed to your house, uh, your car type, whatever you can possibly think of. Uh, it can be as simple as a trading card, or it can be as complex as a. Uh oh, oh, well, oh we lost your audio. You said, you said trading card or. Well, hold on one second. I got the uh, background. Hey, Brian, I, I can t I'll take over for you on that. So basically, when you have cryptocurrency, you have something that it's a fungible token. That means like one can be exchanged for the other. It doesn't matter. You can have a million of them. They're all exactly the same. They're like the dollar. They're like anything. You just basically have whatever. You have a, a, a million coins or a million dollars, a million stamps. Uh, if you make a million Chingo CDs, those are fungible Chingo CDs. It doesn't matter which one you have. But if you take and sign it, it becomes unique. So now it's a non-fungible token. And the way they do that on the blockchain is a coin doesn't have a unique ID. But when you do a non-fungible token, it has a unique ID and a unique address. It's like a credit card or if you have a membership card somewhere. Like we associate it with art and imagery right now, but a non-fungible token is an entry into the blockchain. It can't be changed um, unless you pay a transaction to change it and you have to actually own it to do that. It can't be changed and it can be used to assign ownership to basically anything. So you could have a website where you gave out NFTs and the only way somebody could log into your website is they have, they own that NFT. Mm. Um, and you know exactly, it's this specific NFT that this person owns. You know, you could do the same thing if somebody owns crypto, they can only log in your website if they own Bitcoin in their wallet, but you couldn't tell one from the other. So an interesting way it's being used right now 
is to do the provenance on artwork because you can link it to the art and you can show this chain of ownership for that piece of art. But it can be used for Chingo fan club. You can issue NFTs where only people can go to your shows that have bought your Chingo NFT. Um, it can be like a membership card. So anything you have in your wallet, your driver's license number, your social security number, your, your license plate number, your home address, all these things are non-fungible and can be represented on the blockchain in a digital way. We could issue stocks to our company, assign it, which we're thinking about doing, assign it to a particular NFT, those stocks, and that NFT now will represent those stocks. Mm. Um, and you just you can't do that with crypto. Crypto, you can just exchange it like money or anything else. Yeah. And Is another good thing. All right, I go too far. Uh, another, to uh, listen, you are a programmer. You gave us some, some, some deep thought on that. But, uh, you know, one thing that you can always uh, do with non-fungible tokens um, or NFTs is that now you can dictate who gets paid, what increment, what amount. Let's say you have a guitarist who played on a track that's on an NFT. Well, now that guitar can automatically get paid every time that sells. Or the producer uh, who made that track can automatically get paid or the ghostwriter or whoever you assign can get paid that instant when that NFT sells. That's the power of a contract on a blockchain. It's non-corruptible. You can't change it. It's set in stone. And just think of like a digital trading card. You know, yeah, they're all cards that are made out of plastic or cardboard or whatever. But, you know, I got the Tom Brady rookie and that's worth a lot more than uh, Jose, what's his name, who uh, is third string on, you know, Seattle's defense, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, varies that. And so what we've done is we have attached a social call to our NFT. Uh, and what we've done is we're helping free nonviolent drug offenders with our NFT. And how we're doing that is we're enabling our nonprofit partners, uh, our partners through strategic uh, marketing, along with funding to get them the funds they need to go and operate at a high capacity. And so we're helping free nonviolent drug offenders. We got some pretty kick-ass artwork. Mike Frost is overseeing it. Our lead artist is Johnny Cash out of Austin. And so this group of, let's say, social activists now, um, we have a very unique name. It's called the Dopehead. And the very first thing you think about is, oh my God, what's this Dopehead? You know, people I grew up know. with is what I think. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like dope heads helping dope heads and when we've been able to grow this amazing community in a short period of time um we're already up to about six thousand on our socials and the community is just banging strong right now and so we're releasing ten thousand unique art pieces um and with this art piece you'll have access to the dope head uh universe every holder is gonna receive an executive producer credit in the animated series. So we have an animated series, we have a toy line, and we have NFTs. So this whole conglomerate is a startup. And so what you're doing basically is you're buying into this startup with us and your stock or your representation is this NFT. Not only can you name it and write your character's backstory, but the artwork is fire. We're gonna make sure it increases in value. So you're going to be able to give this to your grandchildren. You know, imagine being able to invest in Disney when they were doing Steamboat Willie, right? If you could have been able to get an NFT of Mickey back then, you'd been like getting paid right now. And that's how we've kind of made this approach with our NFT startup is that, A, we want to have a social cause. We want to make sure that we could impact the world. The second thing is we want to bring value to people. And the third thing the shit's got to look cool, man. It can't be no old, you know, hand-drawn artwork. You know, have a lot all. of fucking fun with it. <laughs> so we've been extra creative with it, taking it to a whole nother level. It's it, it's what you'd expect if Mike Frost and Toe Down got together and did a project wow. together. It's totally different from what everybody's doing. Everybody's just kind of putting a picture up there and saying, hey, here's an NFT, come buy this, you know, and maybe one day it'll, it'll make some money, you know? We're doing the complete opposite. We're trying to impact the world and make a change. At the same time, we're doing an animated series. 
where the community is so interactive that they're writing the scripts, they're helping us direct, they're helping us edit. It's an awesome community. One thing's cool about the community too is when they buy the NFT, they're actually gonna get voting rights. So as we have decisions and stuff that come up, like, you know, here's the list of episodes we plan to do this year. There's 17 of them. Like, they'll get to vote. They can put in suggestions to it. So there's a there's a governance part where they, the actual people that help us get it going actually get a stake in the company as well. So, the, yeah, there's a social cause. There's, there's, you know, there's some SEC stuff we have to work out, but we're going to turn it towards actually an investment into a startup business. So we got toys. We're looking at doing toys like metaverse games like a dope heads casino online um I'm thinking about making it like you know the old ladies are already in the back of the corner store on the slot machine uh-huh. <laughs> thinking about doing like that setup into a metaverse where you go into like a convenience store but there's a giant casino in the back have y'all um, been toys in- and merch and, and and all that and we're hoping all these things feed each other so that we can you know I mean, we all, all three of us know a bunch of people has been locked up for weed and stuff like that. So we want to reach out and start getting those people some help too. Have you guys been uh, in the metaverse? Yeah, of course. How do you get on there? You put on the goggles? Man, you know, metaverse. You need to come and hang out sometimes. That's what you need right? to do. Look, I got this special stuff. It's green. You roll it up. and I'll, I'll bring the volcano. <laughs> Boom, you're in. Just bring the turkey back. I'll show Show you. you know, one thing Facebook is doing is really is really smart is they changed their name to Meta, right? Which just basically means data, right? And so what they're doing is they're trying to tie in the Oculus headset with their metaverse. Because what's going to end up happening is you're going to be able to basically player one is basically going to come into fruition, right? You're going to be able to put on these goggles and you're going to be able to go do things in your own avatar that you know, you want to be a a representation of who you are. The new flex isn't going and buying a diamond Rolex anymore and going taking your girl out to dinner and maybe a hundred people get to see your new Rolex. The new flex is buying a board eight or a dope head NFT and people going, whoa, he just spent 200 grand on a board eight. And that, and when they see it on your Twitter, now hundreds of thousands of people will see it instead of just a hundred people seeing it. So that's Maybe. the new flex, you know, when Jay-Z buys a crypto punk or when Steph Curry buys a board A, or when Dave Chappelle buys a board A, all these are making news. You know, cryptocurrency is coming and NFTs are a great way to introduce people into cryptocurrency. If you don't even know what cryptocurrency is, but you see a cool ass dope head NFT and you're like, what's an NFT and how can I get one? It's going to lead you down a path to purchase crypto and then down to purchase the NFT. So it's a great, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great starter drug for your cryptocurrency degenerative lifestyle that you're going to be living. So it's, you know, it's the gateway drug. It's the gateway drug. NFTs are the gateway drug to crypto. Here's basically the metaverse. You know how like Travis Scott did that thing on Fortnite, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that game is controlled by that company, and everybody's like, oh, he must have worked the deals and done this and that, but everybody watched his concert on the video game. The metaverse isn't any different, except you can buy your own land. Like, we can buy a dope heads plot of land, and we can have Chingo Bling come perform at our dope heads casino, and you, you know, you put on, you can wear your goggles or just look at the monitor. You can do it on your keyboard, but you can get in and you can do this virtual concert like on your own land in in the space. Um, But it's basically just a video game. And like the interesting thing that's happened is now they've added cryptocurrency to it, which gives us this money you can play with in there. But you could take and say you could release like, say, Grand Theft Auto includes cryptocurrencies and NFTs into their game, like on the next release. You would have it where the only way people could listen to the Chingo Bling CD while they're driving their Porsche through Grand Theft Auto is if they buy that NFT. And then, you know, if they resell that NFT, you get you get a percentage of it. So it's going to it's going to completely change the way that we handle our digital assets on the business. end, And it gives us this whole world that we currently didn't have access. And it gives you a way to profit off your secondary market, off your collectible market. Very so anytime somebody sells your collectible, you, you make a cut too. Hey, toe down. When you said uh, the new flex versus the old flex, 
here's right. the, here's the old flex. The old flex is is holding up a whole bunch of paper fiat money on, on Instagram <laughs> with all that inflation. It's like, look at all this. It's worth less by the time y'all see this. <laughs> right. With yeah, that's with, right. With the amount of inflation, uh, crypto and and uh, I guess owning NFT art is a way to hedge against inflation because it's like I got to turn my money into real estate, gold. I got to turn it into something because assets. Long, yeah, the longer it stays in, it's a liability. The longer it stays in paper form. Hey guys, right. what coin? Well, what coin? If you don't mind, not getting too far off the NFTs, but what coins do you guys uh, look at, invest in, or kind of just keep an eye on? So, you know, I take the Brookshire Hathaway approach to my cryptocurrency, although he's not a crypto holder, but I like to identify with the coins that I use on a regular. So I like the Avalanche Network and what they're doing over there on their system. I like Solana. These are not picks, by the way. This isn't like financial advice yeah. or anything. Um, but so I like, I like the Ethereum killers. Um, I'm not a big ADA fan. I'm not one of, you know, I love Charles and everything that he's done, but as far as, you know, community, I love the community, but th it seems like, you know, it, it just loses money too much. I'm sorry. It just, mm. it goes up for a little bit and comes back down and it, it's not, you know, anyway, but yeah, so Avalanche, um, Solana, um, Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, Matic, uh, what else do we have in the wallet? And then uh, I got a couple small caps and I got a couple uh, ICO coins that we've done. Um, I got some crypto meta coins, uh, some tech coins as they call them. Um, I got a lot of NFTs that pay me in their native token for passive income. And that's another thing that NFTs do is they provide a passive income for you. So just by holding a dope head Genesis uh, uh, NFT, you'll receive 10 dope head tokens a day for 10 years. So kind of like the CyberKongs did, what they've done is there's a 10,000 CyberKongs and 1,000 of them are Genesis CyberKongs. And the CyberKongs pay 10 banana tokens a day for 10 years. Well, the banana tokens are trading something at like $25 a WAP. They're making people like, you know, Thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars a month just for holding this NFT, and so NFTs can provide you know uh, passive income for you as well. But as far as cryptos that we're holding, or, or at least I'm holding, I hold about six of them currently. I kind of like to think of them as children. You know, you want to have a bunch of them, but at the same time, you got to be able to watch all of them at the same time. And so I can only watch five, maybe six at a time, and that's almost a full time job. You know, so uh, if you're thinking about getting into crypto, I suggest you do this. YouTube, 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 read, read, read. And before you think about getting into crypto, go back and do some more research. You yeah, know, there's I, a lot of scammers and a lot of, and a lot of people doing, you know, crazy shit out there. You know, find you a mentor, find you somebody that knows something about crypto and talk to them. I look at it from a developer's point of view. So there's a lot of coins out there that for decentralized computing that are going to start competing with Amazon and Google and the big four for cloud services, which means instead of paying Google and Amazon to host your website or for AI type stuff or for basically using uh, for machine learning, things like these things that take an intensive amount of storage or computer power that the big four currently provide. Now there's coins that back up decentralized services that provide those same services at a cheaper fee. And, the, and it's getting better and it's getting faster than the big four that are providing those services. So there's certain coins, you gotta look at them like stock. They're gonna start competing with the four biggest companies on the planet. So there's services that they offer. I look at those and I, I listen to developers and like Polygon basically fixed a lot of problems with Ethereum. So it was a hit. I heard the developers talking about it. I incorporated it. So I would say with crypto, you understand Web3, understand where the internet's going. Um, it's going to be a digital asset based internet. And that's why that's why NFTs and all this stuff are so important. Um, you got to look at things that 
they're all like startup businesses basically. So you got to find, you got to understand it enough and understand the tech side enough to pick the people you think are going to win. Like I picked Polygon. I won big on it. I bought it at like five cents a piece. Um, you know, it's like $2 and 20 cents right now. You mean you don't hold any Dogecoin, bro? I never bought Dogecoin. <laughs> I never bought Shiba. I, I knew I could probably win on those, but I do. It's, it's, it's basically those are a race to whoever pulls out last. You know, whoever you pulls out. You didn't want to buy you know, XRP by chance? No, I didn't get into I don't get into all the... So- so I like XRP actually. Same. I, I like XRP a lot, you know, and the reason being is, you know, they've been on pause by dealing with this government, you know, the investigation. SSP. Exactly. So if you would just take away the time that they've been involved and see how other coins in their similar situations and where they're at now, they're at eight, nine, ten dollars, twenty dollars a coin. So just imagine once XRP gets, you know, cut loose of this crap, I think they're going to make some awesome moves. Not only that, but they're already lined up with the government. They know exactly what the government is looking for. They know exactly what banks to deal with. And so they're going to be a big mover and shaker with a lot of these government folks. Under under a dollar right now. It's like 70 cents right now. XRP is not being investigated. They're being assimilated. It's like the That's Matrix. Right. Like it's Agent Smith's right. going after them. They're going to assimilate them into the system. That's right. Chingo, you got your own questions about crypto? Man, I like how the word assimilation <laughs> and simulation. Mike Frost just blew my mind right there. He said Agent Smith. Which, by the way, That's the right. Matrix was terrible. That's my opinion. It was, oh, it was horrible. Horrible. Yeah. horrible. I, Give me back my money. I want to I, I take listen, the blue I'm pill out of that <laughs> I want to forget. I want the pill that makes you forget. Man, that boy Neo took the cuck pill, bro. <laughs> That's so funny. Not like that, but I was pill. like, who is this? What is going on with this Matrix? Like, these dudes went and had sex changes and everything and come back yeah, and they woke the, the fuck up. They woke the shit out of Matrix. They I'm, killed it. Did you hear about that shit? The sex changes? Like the, like the directors, they got sex changes and shit? Oh, I didn't they're know twins. that. Yeah, I, some shit. I, they're twins. I assumed it from... Yeah. Wow. Hey, listen, I'm, man, I'm here to start nothing but rumors, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, but they, check it out for real. I think they had the dick cut off. Oof. The banana split. Man, gone. Man, Forever. I don't. I you they should have just sold the Matrix to Disney because they Disney would have done better than that. Hey, Amen. Hey, Disney hasn't done that bad with Star Wars. I'm just being. Didn't do that fun. bad. Yeah, I gotta watch the Mandalorian. And uh, the Boba Fett came out. Have y'all seen that? Man, for real. The good. I can't I get into the TV yet. series stuff, man. I it's saw, almost like, as good. It's almost as good as some of the movie stuff. I'm not gonna lie. It's I saw. Good. I saw the first few I mean, minutes. Yeah, I just saw the first few minutes where uh, it takes a little while because it's just like they're not even talking for the first ten minutes, and then uh, Boba Fett, from what I could gather, he was like the ruler of this. Uh, he was like the big crime lord of this land. And Jabba the Hutt had died, and but the new mayor was had beef with him. That's when I ended it because the new mayor was like, Ooh. the new mayor was like, "Bitch, you owe me tribute." Like this is a tribute. Oh, that's that's gonna be good. Yeah, yeah. I'll so give I'm it another good. chance, man. Usually the series kind of they don't go as hard as I'd like them to. Hey, before we get back to yeah. the season stuff, I gotta ask you guys: Did you guys watch Game of Thrones? And can you convince Shingo Bling to watch it? Dude, so Game, Game of Thrones, of Thrones is, dope. is dope. Thank it's you. Dope, like one hundred percent. Like, get past the whole flying dragon thing because they're going to hype it up for you in the show where they're only going to show that damn dragon maybe once a season and you're going to be mad as fuck. But trust me, by the last by the last couple seasons, man, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be loving you some dragons and some <laughs> blonde-haired rulers. Yeah, you know, I'm on Wheel of Time on Amazon right now because I read the, the, the book series. Uh, Wheel of Time, it's like this Robert Jordan... Five million book series from back in the day, kind of on the Game of Thrones stuff, but they did a pretty good job on that. Oh, dope. Well, House of Dragons is coming out later this year, too, all about the Targaryens, if you guys are interested. Oh, hold up, because I got to get on that. Yeah, I'm currently on Billion and uh, Hand of God. I'm and The on- Witcher. If you ain't seen The Witchers, though, I read those books. I'm waiting on Ozark to come back. Bro. Hell yeah, season four this month, the 22nd. They keep teasing yes, sir. me. Man, all right, we totally derailed this podcast. Yeah, uh, no, no, but it, but it all ties in because, for example, 
um, the Matrix. Okay, that's not a community or an NFT. I want to have anything to do with because y'all done made the shit whack. True. So, so I'm gonna listen to my uh, crypto mentors right now. Boom. Here you go. But you know, you can create your own reality now. You can have Chingo World in the metaverse. Amen. The Chingo. You can have the Chingo verse. verse. We have the right? Chingo verse right now the, in the, the newsletter. Tamale stand. Right. Hey, man, we sell Tamale NFTs, fool. Yeah. You you go on, you, you can own one out of the dozen. I'm man, hold up. Rare. Each tamale is is equal is non fungible, and is a, is the salsa extra to put on top? No, that's that's the one that nah. gives you ten salsa ten salsa coins per day per. per month. <laughs> you, get salsa. you get ten salsa. The green the, per the day. green coins are worth ten times as much as the red coins. Yeah. Yes. What'd you get the salsa verde? Oh, hold up, cuz it's got to be the <laughs> it's got to be the creamy jalapeno one. That's when the SEC start oh, getting in your life. <laughs> Wait a minute, he brought out the creamy jalapenos and chewies. Come on, man. That's not even cool, bro. I'm halfway uh, high and halfway home. Well, <laughs> man, I'm proud of Chingo too. I have to say, like, I follow his Instagram and stuff. And all the 20, I mean, being a marketer and all that and watching how like images affect people's behavior and how like, communicating messages, like I've been just kicking back the last two years. It's like, what the fuck is wrong with people? And like <laughs> Chingo's been getting attacked, but I'm like. Man, you've been standing your ground, man. Keep standing your ground and everything. Because yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Make, people yeah, don't no. make no sense right now. Yeah. And, and it's all good. It's not their fault. They don't, they don't be knowing. But, you know, the kind of world that we envision, you know, because obviously we don't have a whole lot of control or say as to where society is headed. Like, mm. like you just finished saying it's going to be based on uh, digital assets. And this is a system right. as to how we can regulate and interchange and, and where the value, you see what I'm saying? So, so that's why I get so worked up about like policy and freedom of speech and what, what the hell is big tech doing and all this kind of stuff, because it's kind of like, we should have a little knowledge and say, and not be left out of the game in terms of as everything transforms and shifts, we kind of want to know what the hell is going on? Well, yeah, think of it this way. If Big Tech's trying to take you off of Twitter, how, what are they going to do when we're all in? If they all want us in the metaverse, Facebook wants everybody in the metaverse, how much control are they going to have over you and us and these assets if they're censoring you in the real world right now? But hold on, check game. The whole purpose of the metaverse is decentralized. So now we can have a Twitter that's not going to ban you. Now it's totally decentralized. We can make a Twitter right now, the Chingo Twitter right now, and there are no rules. Say whatever the fuck you want to say. You're not going to get banned. It's decentralized. And, and that's what's so important about the metaverse. And that's what's so There's, important about decentralization, period. And Chingo, you're right. It's about knowledge. People are scared of knowledge. For whatever reason, they're afraid to crack open a book or go dig on YouTube for a minute or try to educate themselves. People are scared of knowledge. They want to just stay dumb. And when you arm yourself with knowledge, you elevate yourself. So the best thing that ever happened to me was going to prison because I read my first book in prison. I didn't even know I liked to read until I read my, my first book. I called home that day. I said, Mom, I read my first book. She almost had a heart attack. It was just one of those things. So it's that knowledge thing. How do you arm yourself? You know, the best investment beyond crypto, beyond NFTs, and is, is an investment in yourself. If you don't take in the time to invest in yourself and get your knowledge up, then you're going to be where you're going to be at. Don't be mad because somebody's having success or they're a different opinion or whatever it may be because they got enough knowledge where they can talk correctly or educate themselves or make better moves than you. So it's about that knowledge thing. People are just deathly afraid of it. Well, well uh, man, I'm really excited about the Dope Heads NFT because to have a, a couple of Houston legends, very influential to, to also know a lot about this stuff and help curate this type of community and world, you know, visually and everything. And it has the social give back component. You know, it, it's very exciting to, uh, to know that, you know what, there's hope in the metaverse, you know, because there's going to be some cool <laughs> shit on there. Not everybody's going to be a Mark Zuckerberg dweeb. You know what I mean? Um, so I'm down with hope, hope up with dope. Wait, is that how it goes? Down with, up with hope, down, down with hope, down with hope, up with dope. So, yeah. Up on a rope. <laughs> yeah. So where can listeners of the podcast uh, support you guys, check it out, and, and, and participate? 
So it's real simple. You can go to dopeheadsnft.com, D-O-P-E-H-E-A-D-S-N-F-T.com. You can hit us up on Instagram. It's dopeheadsnft. You can hit us up on Twitter. Surprise, it's dopeheadsnft. We're real simple. It's not spelled different. It's dopeheadsnft. Click on any one of the socials. It'll lead you to the Discord. The Discord is where it's at. And like I said before, it's dope heads, hope it's dope heads. You get in the chat, you get lost. The next thing you know, it's been six hours. The dogs haven't been fed. Your wife and kids are, are fell asleep or something on the couch if you're still in the chat. So it's a very awesome, lively community. People want to help other people. You know, like I said, there's only going to be 10,000 dope heads. So if 100,000 people want 10,000 dope heads, you see what's going to happen. So we urge and encourage people to please get on the pre-sale white list so you can guarantee you get you a dope head NFT. The only must-have NFT for 2022 is the dope head. What's the deadline or what's like the launch date? Can you reiterate that? So the launch date as of right now is going to be February the 8th for the public sale. And for the pre-sale, if you get on the white list, you can mint 24 hours ahead of that. Now, if you don't have any idea what a mint is, what an NFT is, don't worry. Like I said, just go to Dope Heads NFT on your favorite social media platform. It will lead you to the Discord and will educate you through the entire process. It's one or two clicks, and that's it. Super simple. If I can do it, listen, if this old Dope Head can do it, you can do it too. <laughs> Man, uh, I, I predict that uh, some of your some of your records from back in the day might might trend on TikTok, man. Some of this shit is uh, too jamming. Well, I appreciate that. Hey, listen, if you can get the dope heads NFT on TikTok to trend, anybody that's seeing this podcast right now, if you do a stitch or a duet with the dope heads NFT, I'll automatically put you on the pre-sale white list. Oh, how's that hey. sound? All you got to do is hit hashtag. Chingo bling, dope head. That's it. Oh shit! Let me get on that ASAP. That's what's up. Hey, we should get Chingo. We should get Chingo on our very dope head. I think we. I think we got to now. I. I think it's a must have. A yeah, one of sure. one. Ooh. Boy, you know how? Ooh, look at here! Look at here! <laughs> I don't. I don't even know what that means, but I'm excited. <laughs> so what? So basically, what it means is you're gonna have a custom created dope head that is based after you so it's going to be a one of product. one oh cool so so you know it's almost like owning somebody's uh championship ring right they got their name in it like they have this lebron james championship ring so it'd be the same thing if somebody had the chingo bling nft you're never going to get rid of it because it's your own dope head but for some way somehow if it ever got loose in the metaverse that thing would be worth a pretty penny Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> hey man, well thank you guys so much. Uh, I'm going to be bumping the music appreciate you. and uh, appreciating the art and uh, fo follow them on Instagram. And of course, don't forget TikTok, Chingo Bling, hashtag Chingo Bling Dope Heads. Do a duet, do a stitch. We'll put you on the pre sale white list. Chingo Bling Dope Heads. Get That's on it. the white list for sure. Well, thank you guys so much, man. I appreciate it, man. Very excited. We're going to keep an eye on it and uh, we're going to spread the word for sure. Man, Chingo good talking to you, brother. Chingo. Props, respect. Y'all have a good one.